children ages three through second grade, you're dismissed to children's church. <laughs> and for those that are joining us online, I apologize. Our video is not working correctly, so it's weird looking. And uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, we may just go to showing just the slides. Um, I don't know if we can do that or not, but um, anyhow, apologize for that. The video is just all, it's weird. <laughs> you can't see the video is basically where we're at. But hey, um, we're talking about the seventh mark of the eight marks of the church. This is the submitted to godly leadership church. That's this mark. And uh, so I chose uh, uh, some myths today, some urban legends or myths uh, about leadership. And so um, Carrie uh, Newhoff shares five dumb myths every leader should abandon. The first one is this, success will happen overnight. Who hasn't fallen for this, right? He says, and if you don't believe it, you secretly want it, haven't you? Like it, it, success will just happen overnight. Yet there are few overnight successes. Or as my wife, and this is uh, Carrie speaking, or as my wife has pointed out, it was a very long night, right? Success happened overnight, but it was a really long night. It took a long time. Number two, smart work, not hard work, will win the day. Now, smart work is no substitute for hard work. Working smarter doesn't mean you can put a, in a few hours, hit cruise control, and coast to victory. When you stop growing, so do the people around you. So you have to work hard and smart. Number three, I will get universal buy-in. There will be a day when I become a good enough leader that I will announce our next move and everyone will applaud wildly, right? He says, conditions will never be perfect. Quote, unquote, everybody will never buy in. Sometimes you just need to lead. Number four, there's a silver bullet. So there's one thing that will turn everything around, right? A silver bullet, a model I can just embrace and press play, and everything will magically be wonderful, Be wonderful, right? No, not going to happen. And then finally, number five, one day I will arrive. He says, no, you won't. And if you do, you'll arrive to learn you've missed the point, <laughs> right? Effective leaders keep growing. They never stop. When I worked for Child Evangelism Fellowship at the World Headquarters years and years ago, I used to read three books at, at once. I mean, not at the same time, but, you know, at the, yeah, anyhow, you know what I'm saying. I would read a leadership book so that I could grow my leadership. I'd read a, a personal spiritual development book, and then I'd have a fun book, like a historical fiction or something like that, that I'd be reading. And uh, it was just incredible. It, it, I was just uh, devouring these books, and I was always looking to grow in my spiritual walk and leadership knowledge. And today, I read a lot of spiritual growth uh, uh, books uh, through commentaries and other books. And uh, I read books on prayer and some leadership stuff as well. And I still have a fun book here and there that I, I read from time to time, but I don't read it as often as the others that I read. But it's just so that I can stay sharp. I can continue to grow in, in leadership and spirituality. And so as we think about these uh, myths that Carrie shared with us this morning, there are many common myths about the church that are misguided at best and dangerous at worst. And the myth that we're going to look at today is you can have subjective standards for church leadership and be a healthy church. And if we believe that myth, it can be dangerous for two reasons. If the leaders of the church are not subject to the objective standards of leadership in the church, the people of the church won't be subject to the objective standards of discipleship in the church. So we have to have some standards that we're following. We have those in Scripture. We're going to look at those today for leadership. Number two, um, if we believe this myth, you can have subjective standards instead of objective standards. This confuses the church, exposes the church, and it robs the church of its sense of security. So if we're just dreaming up ways that you're supposed to follow leadership here, the leadership's supposed to be acting and doing it like that, and no objective standards, it's just going to be confusing for you all. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to rob the church of its security. It's just going to expose the church. And so we know that this is a myth because Jesus said a clear mark of a healthy church would be a church filled with leaders who are being led by him, leading like him, and leading to him. And so as we think about that, would you just bow your heads with me as we commit this to the Lord in prayer? Lord, we come to you today as leaders, as followers, and, and we cry out to you in humility, asking that you would guide and direct us through your word today. I pray that your word would be heard in each heart and mind. I, hear that, I pray that your voice would be heard and not mine. 
that, Lord God, I, I wouldn't uh, say things that are not what you want said today. And so I submit myself to you today. Lord, use me as your mouthpiece today for your honor and glory. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, the mark is the Submitted to Godly Leadership Church. And as we've been doing through all of the marks, we're looking at it from the teachings of Jesus to the teachings of the early church to the teachings of the apostles. We're going to again look at those three areas uh, throughout Scripture and see what it has to tell us today about this, this particular mark. We're going to start in Mark chapter 3. Verses 13 to 15. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there this morning. <clears throat> and we're going to be looking uh, then at Luke chapter 22. So as we're talking about the teachings of Jesus. Here's what God's Word says. Mark chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. And so let me give you a little background, too, of what was going on here. We find it actually in the corresponding passage to this same uh, uh, story, uh, or a biblical account, I should say, in Luke chapter 22, verses 24 to 27. We see the same thing happening there, but we get a little bit more background. This corresponding passage, I'm sorry, in Luke chapter 6, 12 to 16, tells us that Jesus had been up on the mountainside praying all night before he called uh, the disciples to him and appointed them as apostles. So he took this very seriously about setting up who the leaders were going to be uh, for the early church. And so in the morning, he called the disciples up on the mountainside and chose the 12 apostles. And he's appointing them apostles. Most scholars agree that the number of apostles is probably significant because there were 12 tribes of Israel. And that number 12 just pops up all throughout Scripture. It's a significant um, uh, number within Scripture. And then Jesus designates them apostles. Now, this was a change from simply calling them disciples to apostles. Warren Wearsby helps us understand the difference between the two. He says a disciple is one who learns by doing. Our modern equivalent might be an apprentice. An apostle was one who was sent on official service with a commission. We know that that great commission, what that great commission is in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus had many disciples, but only 12 apostles, his special ambassadors. And so he appointed them for a specific purpose. We see him appointing them for two reasons, that they might be with him. Now, that's important. They needed to be with him. Uh, Wearsby and Grasmick both agree that being with Jesus was for the purpose of training them, modeling for them uh, what leadership, servant leadership was to look like. And the 12 apostles would learn from Jesus' example. And once they were ready, he was going to send them out. And that's the second thing that we see in this passage of Scripture, that he might send them out to accomplish two things. One, to preach, and two, to have authority to drive out demons. And we know that they accomplished that, that purpose. As we look at Mark chapter 6, verses 6 to 7 and 12 to 13, this is what it says. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. Then verses 12 and 13 tell us this. They went out and preached that people should repent. There's the preaching. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So they accomplished what God or Jesus had sent them out to do, to preach and to cast out demons, to drive out demons. How does this apply to us? J.C. Ryle, uh, in uh, Expository Thoughts on Mark, uh, just outlines four things for those in leadership. Like the apostles, the faithful minister ought to keep up close communion with Christ. We need to be with Christ as leadership. Number two, like the apostles, the faithful minister ought to be a preacher. This must ever be his principal work and receive the greatest part of his thoughts. He must place it above the administration of the sacraments. So they need to be about the word. They need to be with Jesus, and they need to be sharing those words that Jesus is sharing with them. Number three, like the apostles, the faithful minister must labor to do good in every, day, in every way. Though he cannot heal the sick, he must seek to alleviate sorrow and to increase happiness among all with whom he has to do. He must strive to be known as the comforter, the counselor, the peacemaker, the helper, and the friend of all. And then finally, number four, like the apostles, the faithful minister must oppose every work of the devil. 
We have to oppose that work of the devil. Jesus chose 12 men to be his apostles. These 12 men were going to lead the founding of the church. And in their humanness, the apostles struggled with the worldly idea of greatness, which Jesus had to address. That's what we look at when we look at Luke chapter 22. And so if you want to turn there this morning, and I'll try to get there. Verses 24 to 27, we see what's going on here. And this is around the time where Jesus is having the Last Supper with his disciples or in his apostles. This is what it says, Luke 22, 24 to 27. Also a dispute arose among uh, uh, among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I'm among you as one who serves. He's like, wow, listen, guys, you shouldn't be arguing about this. They were arguing about which of them was the greatest, and the significance of what Jesus was sharing with them at the Last Supper was lost on them. He's like telling them, hey, the, the, this bread is like my body. It's going to be broken for you. And, and this, this wine is like my blood. It's going to be poured out for you. And they're like, I wonder which one of us is the greatest. It's like they, to- it, 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 they totally missed it. And he's like, do you understand I'm about to die <laughs> for, for the sins of the world? And they're like, which one of us is the greatest? We've got to figure this out. Jesus just said he's going to leave. You know, that's all they're thinking about. He's not going to be around anymore. Which one, is, which one of us is the greatest? Warren Wearsby says, when, when you are interested in promoting yourself, it doesn't take much to start an argument. <laughs> Isn't that true? I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. We see worldly greatness and leadership here explained. It's characterized by selfishness and arrogance and doing whatever it takes to make it to the top. And some of the kings in the ancient world, they called themselves benefactors. They gave themselves that title, but it didn't re- represent who they were and what they did. They just simply said, hey, I'm a benefactor, you know. They gave them that, themselves that title. It didn't mean anything. It, it didn't mean that they were benefiting their people. And then we see spiritual greatness and leadership as Jesus uh, explains it here. First, he talks about them being like the youngest, In in the culture of the day, the youngest person was the one who was considered the least. They did not have rank or position, especially as it pertained to family units. The firstborn or the eldest would be the one who who had the rank and position within the family. He would inherit everything. He was in charge. And uh, Butler says, The senior leader with the most experience must adopt an attitude as if, as if he were the youngest with no experience, no leadership responsibility, and no honors expected. And then he goes on, Jesus says, not just the youngest, but as one who serves. Servant leadership is what Jesus is telling them to do. And Paul talks a lot about this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, when he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. We struggle with that because we're selfish. We, we don't want to uh, do this. We consider others better than ourselves. We want to raise ourselves up. <clears throat> John the Baptist modeled this. He has disciples that are following him as he's baptizing out in the wilderness. You know the story, and <clears throat> Jesus comes on the scene, and, and John the Baptist is like the second time that Jesus comes on the scene there in the wilderness. He says to his disciples, you know, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then they're like, that's amazing. And, but then some of his disciples come back to him, and they say, you know, Jesus is baptizing as well. Like he's taking people away from you. And, and John's response to that is this. We see it in John chapter 3. Verse 30, he must become greater, I must become less. John the Baptist understood servant leadership. He understood that Jesus was greater than him. He understood what it looks like to consider others better than himself. He's like, no, this is who I'm telling you about. I've been telling you all this time about there's someone that's coming. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And this is it. It's him. He must become greater. I must become less. And then we see Jesus' example. Jesus is the one who's serving the bread and the, the cup at the supper, which would represent kind of the head of the household. That's what the head of the household would do. But then Jesus gives them an example uh, as the head of the household of what servant leadership looks like by taking a towel, wrapping it around his waist, and washing his disciples' feet. Wow. 
That's the greatest becoming the least and serving. Ryle says youthfulness in the world and church, a humble readiness to do anything and put our hands to do any good work, a cheerful willingness to fill any post, however lowly, and discharge any office, however unpleasant, if we can only promote happiness and holiness on earth. These are the true tests of Christian greatness. And then Butler kind of adds to that. He says, you must make a choice. Will you accept the world's oppressive way of honoring greatness? Or will you follow Jesus' example of becoming a servant and seeking the best for the family? Will you be part of the last who will become first? Or must you be first now? That's a question we all have to ask ourselves. And Jesus teaches us that he is the one who establishes spiritual leaders and that spiritual leadership is remarkably different than worldly leadership. In fact, it's almost the reverse. So that's what Jesus is teaching us. But what about the early church? Well, we have to turn to Acts. We're going to look at two passages in the book of Acts. The first one's Acts chapter 2, verse 42. <clears throat> and then we'll be looking at Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 42 tells us this. So the submitted to godly leadership church and the teaching of the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, as we saw in the previous point, Jesus had chosen the 12 apostles, trained them, and sent them out to preach and teach. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 shows us what happened after Jesus ascended into heaven and sent his apostles out. They went back into the Jerusalem. Remember, they were in the upper room. They were waiting for the, the gift that Jesus had promised them was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they are able to speak in other languages that they didn't know. <clears throat> People were hearing uh, the glory of God uh, proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in their own language, and uh, 3,000 were added to their number on Pentecost plus those who were already followers of Jesus. And all of those people were devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles. The believers were submitting themselves to the godly leadership of the apostles. And so we see that in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And as the number of believers continued to grow, there had to be the delegation and sharing of leadership responsibilities, as we see in Acts chapter 6, verses 3 to 4. Look at those verses with me, if you would. Just turn a few pages over. This is what God's Word says. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. So this is the apostles uh, teaching and talking to the people. Gangle in his commentary says, Ministry is everyone's responsibility, but different ministry tasks require different ministry qualifications. And so the seven uh, uh, that were to be chosen needed to have two primary qualifications. We see it here in that passage. They needed to be full of the Spirit, just meaning that they're controlled by the Holy Spirit, and full of wisdom. Now that's going to be important. And they were given the responsibility of waiting on tables. Now, this certainly has the idea of serving food to the widows. It can also have the idea of a manager's table where funds for food are distributed. The reason I, I bring that up is if we look at Acts chapter 4, verses 34 and 35, we see these words. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. So they would need to have wisdom. These seven need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, and they need to have wisdom to know how to distribute those funds to those that were in need. And we see, while the very important task uh, of providing for the needs of all widows was delegated to seven men, the apostles dedicated their time to two things. They gave their attention to, the, to prayer and the ministry of the Word. <clears throat> the prayer that's being talked about here is not uh, private prayer, it's public prayer. It's leading others in public prayer, corporate prayer. And they certainly had their own quiet time of prayer also, but what's being talked about here in, in Acts chapter 6 is corporate prayer. And then the ministry of the word. In Mark chapter 3, we saw that this was one of the primary things that Jesus sent the apostles out to do. And it was to preach God's word. And while ministering to the physical needs of the believers was important, the primary responsibility of the apostles was to the spiritual needs of the believers. They needed the necessary time to prepare and teach God's word. 
And that's not to say that they didn't still help with food or money distribution, but that wasn't their primary role. And so the early church teachings help us understand that spiritual leaders are tasked with leading believers into corporate prayer and the teaching of God's word. But what about the apostles? What are they teaching us about the godly, um, submitted to godly leadership? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 tells us this. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. So here he's, you know, the apostles are telling us, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, I'm sorry, is telling us, obey your leaders. Barnes says the reference here is to their religious teachers and not to civil rulers. So they're talking about the religious teachers here. And um, uh, Warren Wearsby goes on, he says, when a servant of God is in the will of God, teaching the word of God, the people of God should submit and obey. Let me just read that for you one more time. When a servant of God is in the will of God, teaching the word of God, the people of God should submit and obey. Now, my desire and practice has always been to be in the will of God and teaching the word of God. My prayer is that this desire and practice are evident to you all. Now, there have been times when leading Idaville Church has felt like a burden. But those times are few and far between. And during those times when I'm feeling down, I just reflect on the calling that God placed in my life 13 years ago. And I just find encouragement and hope knowing that I'm doing just what he wants me to be doing. I'm right where he wants me to be. And the vast majority of my time here has been joy-filled. I love you all. I want you to know that. I love you. I love serving together with you. I want us to just continue to grow in this love for one another. That's our theme for this year. I want to see us grow in our love for those in our community as well. And so Wearsby continues. He says, a disobedient Christian will find on that day that the results of disobedience are unprofitable. That's what he says here in this passage. Not for the pastor, but for himself. That's powerful, isn't it? You're going to find that that it's just unprofitable for you. And then he says, keep watch and give account. The leadership of Idaville Church is genuinely concerned for the spiritual growth and salvation of those that God has placed in our care to shepherd. Each board member has a group of individuals and families that they're responsible to connect with and check up on. We take that responsibility very seriously because uh, we will have to give an account when we stand before the Lord. And while the writer of Hebrews exhorts the people in the church to obey the leaders, Paul writes to to Timothy to share the qualifications of those who serve in positions of leadership. We see that in 1 Timothy chapter 3. He talks about the uh, overseers, which are elders and deacons. And this is what God's Word says. We're going to look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he uh, take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Deacons, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if uh, there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, not temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. And so we see here first the overseer. This is a noble task. I want us to understand that today. 
This is a noble task to step into that position of leadership. And we see the qualifications, both positive and negative. The positive ones are this, above reproach, a uh, husband of a one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, gentle, manage their family well, be a, have a good reputation with outsiders. And then the negative ones are not uh, given to drunkenness, not violent, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, not a recent convert. And so when people uh, tell me that they don't meet the qualifications of an overseer, uh, a lot of times they're like, Whew, good, I don't have to serve that way. And I say, no, nope. You say you don't qualify, I say, in what area or areas? Well, in this one, that one, there's where you need to start working because you do need to qualify. And it's not just so that you serve as an overseer in the church. These are qualifications so that you can serve as a spiritual leader of your household. That, for me, is so much more important. But this doesn't get us off the hook. No, you don't get to look at this and just go, oh, well, I don't qualify in that area. No, that's where we have to start working. That's where we have to work hard to qualify on multiple levels. Same is true for the deacon. We see the qualifications here. Positive, worthy of respect, sincere, keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience, a husband of but one wife, managing their children and household well. The negatives are not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. And they're supposed to be tested. And if nothing's found against them, then they need to serve as a deacon. And their wives are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, temperate and trustworthy. And so the teaching of the apostles helps us to understand that when qualified leaders are following God's will and teaching his word, uh, that they should be obeyed and followed. Now, we not only see this mark proclaimed through the teachings of Jesus, the early church, and the apostles, but we also see a picture of it. And um, uh, Sue read one of the verses that I want us to look at today out of 1 Peter chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 1 to 4. And this is the flock of God. Peter is speaking here, and he says this, To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, uh, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And so what we see here in this uh, picture, this metaphor, Peter does not use his position as an apostle to elevate himself above the other elders. He positions himself as a fellow elder that, has, that was privileged to witness Jesus' sufferings and to share in the glory that will be revealed in the future. And he says, shepherd God's flock. I like what uh, Anders says. He says, to shepherd means to lead, to guide, and to rule. According to Psalm, he's talking about Psalm 23, the tasks of a shepherd are to lead, to provide spiritual guidance and feeding, to offer comfort, strengthening, and correction. In John chapter 21, verse 16, we read these words. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. This was the second time that Jesus asked Peter this question after he had come back alive again. After he had restored, this is when he's restoring Peter. He's, he asks him the same question three times. This is the second time. And the same Greek word uh, used in John 21, 16 by Jesus is the one that Peter uses in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 for shepherd. He hasn't forgotten what Jesus had exhorted him to do. So here Peter says, uh, yeah, Jesus says, take care of my sheep, and that's the exact same Greek word as shepherd. So take care of my sheep. So shepherding or taking care involves two relationships, as Warren Wiersbe points out, being among the people so that you know their needs and their problems, and being over the people, leading them and helping to solve their problems. And then we see the attitude of the shepherd that they should have. It should be a willingness, not a task or a duty. It should be a joy. Not greedy for money, but certainly worthy of their hire. Eager means with enthusiasm, excitement, and energy. And being an example to the flock. Matt Kaiser says this, Just as a flock of sheep follows their shepherd, we follow Jesus, our shepherd. 
Just as a flock of sheep are submitted to and obey their shepherd, we submit to and obey Jesus and the under shepherds he has appointed for us. So how does this apply to us? How do we know if this mark marks the church, or marks our church? Four things. First, we can see, we can clearly see the leaders in our church being led by Jesus. John 21, 22. Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Jesus is talking to Peter here. This is after he's restored him with those three questions. They're walking along the Sea of Galilee at this point. John is following behind them. Jesus is talking to Peter, and he's telling Peter, this is how you're going to die. And Peter goes, well, what about John? How's he going to die? And, and Jesus says, don't worry about him. Follow me. Don't worry about anybody else. Follow me. That's what he's telling him here. And, and so uh, we can see, clearly see the leaders in our church being led by Jesus. We're following Jesus. And so the second one is we can clearly see the leaders in our church be, uh, leading like Jesus. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 35. Then he called the crowd to uh, him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Our desire as leadership in the church is to daily deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. We want to lead like Jesus so that when you follow, you'll be following Jesus, not us. You'll be following Jesus. Number three, we can clearly see the leaders in our church leading to Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Pastor Mark and I strive to admonish and teach you with all wisdom. And our desire is to be able to present you perfect in Christ because we are held accountable before God. Number four, we can clearly see the people of our church joyfully submitted to their leaders. Hebrews 13, 17, we already saw this uh, verse before, but I'm going to read it to you again. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. And so our desire is to have a church filled with leaders who are being led by Jesus, leading like Jesus, and leading to Jesus. And that just takes us to the survey that we had you all do. There were two of the five survey questions that were in the top 15 of the least difficult for us as a church, meaning that we embrace these. We understand these, we get it, and we agree with it. The first one is this. I'm confident that the leaders in our church are biblically qualified leaders, as outlined in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. So those are the, we read the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3 for the overseers and the deacons. So that's, that's important. I'm glad that you feel that way. If the leaders of our church did not meet those qualifications, we'd be in trouble. The second one was this in the top 15. That one was 8 out of 10. This is 11 out of 15. The leaders in our church are clearly submitted to Jesus and his leadership of our church as explained in Scripture and empowered by the Spirit. And so again, I'm glad that that's, that's, the, that's the result of the survey. Pastor Mark, the board, and I looked at Jesus as our shepherd. We looked to the Holy Spirit for guidance and direction and how and where to lead the congregation for the future. Now, one of the remaining three questions was in the top 15 and the most difficult for us, meaning that we struggle with this one. And this is the, it was 12 out of 15. I desire to lead others the way my leaders lead our church. It's hard to determine from the survey why this scored in the top 15 the most difficult for us. When we look at the two previous survey questions, it's clear that the leaders are biblically qualified, submitted to Jesus, and empowered by the Spirit. So I don't have an answer for that. I don't know why it scored where it did. And sharing this with uh, someone this week, um, they said, well, some people just don't want to lead. So they see that word lead. I want to lead. I don't, no, I don't want to lead. <laughs> I don't want to lead at all. And then some people, they also said some people don't feel qualified to lead. But again, that, we already talked about that. Like, here's what we need to do. You, you don't feel qualified, that, that's okay. That's the areas where we need to work on. The two remaining uh, questions fell in the middle, just in the middle of the survey, and not close to the top or the bottom. These were the two. Our leaders are the kinds of leaders I desire to submit myself to, and I will joyfully follow the lead of our leaders in the next season in the life of our church. Here's, here's my exhortation for you today. 
if the leaders of the church are biblically qualified, submitted to Jesus, and empowered by the Spirit, then as the flock of God here at Idaville Church, we should do a couple of things. We, we should want to lead others the way the leaders of our church lead the church. We should desire to submit ourselves to the leaders. And we should joyfully follow the lead of the leaders in the next season in the life of our church. So I have some next steps for us today. The first one is for the leaders of the church, those of you that are here. We need to make sure that we are being among the people so that we will know their needs and problems that they face. We also need to lead well by helping them to solve their problems. So leaders, that first next step on the back of the communication card is for you today, and that's to commit to connecting with the people of Idaville Church so I can lead them well. Now for you as a congregation, as the leaders of the church commit to connecting with you and leading you well, then we should submit to them and joyfully follow their lead. Don't misunderstand me. This does not mean that we'll always agree with them. But if they are biblically qualified, submitted to Jesus, and empowered by the Spirit, we can have confidence in their leadership because it's God who's guiding and directing them. It's the Holy Spirit who's empowering them. And so that second next step is for you, and it's to submit to the leadership of Idaville Church and joyfully follow their lead for the future. Now, I have one more, and it's for all of us. Our theme this year is to love one another. Our memory verse last month was Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. It says this, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Here's the challenge. If both leadership and the people strive to follow these two verses, then everything is going to work out for God's glory. The leaders are going to lead well, and the followers are going to follow well. And so this is the next step for all of us, and it's to love sincerely, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to my brothers and sisters at Idaville Church, and honor others above myself. As we think about um, just the strategic plan that we did as a leadership team during the Dream Retreat, a couple of things. We established some core values that I think uh, uh, are applicable to this today. One of them is this, and you see all of them written on the front of the bulletin this morning. We live, model, and share the importance of being biblically grounded. When we're biblically grounded, then we're going to know uh, the qualifications for our leaders. We're going to know what we're required to do as followers. Number two, our leadership strives to be led more by Jesus, to lead more like Jesus, so we can lead more to Jesus. We're, we're constantly working on that. Under the growth strategy, one of the th three uniques is the preaching and teaching of God's Word. And I just addressed that with living and modeling, a being biblically grounded. And then one of the goals that we have for this year is to begin a leadership development program. And I've been in contact with several individuals within the church about that, and we're hoping to get that started sooner than later here. I'm hoping by the beginning of April to start that leadership development, to raise up strong spiritual leaders in our church. Now, uh, the worship team's going to come uh, as I pray, but I want to open the altar this morning for anyone who would like to commit to the next steps that are outlined in the message today. Because guess what? I'm not naive. Every one of us is probably guilty of not doing something that we should be doing, whether it's leading in a particular way or following as we should. And so I just want to open the altar, and uh, I encourage you to come Logan's just going to play softly for a little bit. And